Bible with you or the Bible app on your phone. John 19 is where we will be this morning for the most part. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have all the verses on the screens here, and you can follow along with us there. Um, so I don't want to sound like the crotchety old guy who's always saying, you know, back in my day and, you know, when I was growing up, things were so much better than they are today. But I really do believe that I grew up in the golden age of television. Okay, because when I was growing up, when I was a kid, we had the glory that was TGIF. All right, anybody remember TGIF? Right, if you don't remember it, or um, for those of you who are too young to have experienced it, it was basically the prime time hours on ABC on Friday nights. And TGIF gave us shows like uh, Full House, Hanging with Mr. Cooper, Boy Meets World, Sister, Sister, all these amazing classic shows. And so as a kid in the 90s, there was really nothing better than having a sleepover at a friend's house on a Friday night, getting some stuffed crust pizzas from Pizza Hut, a two liter of Surge, and hanging out on the couch watching TGIF. All right, that was like as good as it got. But for me, for my money, I think the greatest show that we ever got from TGIF was Family Matters. All right, can I get an amen? Anybody? All right, like three of you are with me. That's good. The Family Matters was incredible. If you never saw it, Family Matters, it, it chronicled the life of the Winslow family and all of the joys and all of the struggles that they experienced as a family. And I think that show did such an incredible job of showing the love that can take place within a family. And it really did an incredible job of showing just how much family really does matter. Because in that show we saw things, we saw like the grandma living in there in the house with the family and being cared for and loved. We saw the aunt who was widowed with a young son moving in with the family and living with them to be loved and to be cared for. Well, we saw Steve Urkel, the next-door neighbor, who, although he was super annoying and obnoxious and drove the Winslows crazy, they would even welcome him into their home and accepted him just like a member of their own family. And that show to me was such a great reminder of the, the deep and abiding value of family. And that value of family, that, that's really a value that is birthed out of Scripture, Scripture from beginning to end over and over and over again reminds us of how important family is. And so as we continue the series, Famous Last Words, where we're looking at the words of Jesus from the cross, what we're going to see this morning is that in, in God's mind, in the kingdom of God, there is so much value placed on the family that as Jesus is hanging on the cross, paying for the sin of all mankind, he stops and he pauses to draw our attention and draw our focus to just how much family matters. And in doing so, he, he gives us this amazing message that, that our families go even far beyond who we think are part of our family. So John 19, we're going to pick it up in verse 25. This is what it says. It says, Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, and Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So here, right off the bat, we see not only the scene that is happening at the cross, but we see who is there at the cross. And, and it tells us that as Jesus is there hanging on the cross, paying for our sin, with his flesh torn like ribbons, as his blood is being spilled, as he is crying out in agony, as the crowds are walking by and taunting and mocking him, there at that scene... There are these four women steadfast standing by the side of Jesus. Now, if you've been in church a long time, you've probably heard some preacher like me get up, maybe around Easter time, and they said something like, well, you know, at his arrest and during the crucifixion, all of Jesus' followers abandoned him. And to be honest, I think I've probably said something like that before. But what we see here in the text is that's not entirely true. What is true, what we do see in Scripture, is that all of Jesus' male followers abandoned him. All the dudes checked out. Right? The guys ran away. In Jesus' darkest moment of greatest need, all the guys ran away and left his side. 
But we see here at the cross, we see these four women courageously standing by the side of Jesus, having never left the side of their Savior. And I point that out to say to those of you women, whether you're young or old, whether you're 18 or 80, never minimize the strength and the courage that God has placed inside of you to make a difference for his kingdom. Right? Never minimize that. God has put incredible potential inside all of us to make a difference in his kingdom. Be like these women who were boldly standing in their faith even when no one else was willing to do so. So we see this scene as Jesus is there on the cross. We see these four women standing steadfast. But then as we keep reading, we see that there is actually one guy there with him. It goes on in verse 26. It says, when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple that he loved. So here it tells us there is one of Jesus' male followers who was there at the cross. It says this was the disciple that he loved. So this is talking about his follower, John. Now, here's why that's interesting that John is there at the cross. It's because, remember, about 12 hours earlier, the night before when Jesus was arrested, John was among all the other guys who ran away. John was among all the other disciples who cowered in fear and ran away from Jesus. John had abandoned Jesus the night before. He figuratively and literally ran away from his Savior. That's what John did. But now he's returned. Now he's back. And what's amazing about this is when John returns to the side of Jesus, what we're going to see in a second is that Jesus doesn't even rebuke him. Jesus doesn't mock him. Jesus doesn't criticize him. Jesus doesn't say, hey, John, nice of you to show up now. You know, where have you been for the last 12 hours? Man, I could have really used a friend last night. Jesus doesn't do any of that. When John returns to the side of Jesus, what we're going to see in just a second is instead of rebuking him, Jesus bestows on John this incredible honor, and he entrusts him with this incredible privilege that we're going to read about in just a minute. And here's why I I stop and pause and point that out, even though that's not really the focus of our text today. It's because there's probably some of you here or some of you watching online who you can relate to John in that you've run away from your Savior. Like you're a Christian, you're a a follower of Jesus, but in whatever way it looks like for you, you've run away from Jesus. You've abandoned him, You've, you've left his side and you know it and you feel guilty about it and you feel convicted about it. And you've thought about coming back, you've thought about returning, but, but you've been scared to return to Jesus because you're afraid that you may be met with rebuke. But look at the example of John. When John returns to the side of his Savior, he's met with grace, not rebuke. So remember, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how fast you have run away, it's never too late to return to the cross of Jesus. And he always welcomes us back no matter how long we've been gone. John had abandoned Jesus, but the moment he returns, Jesus welcomes him back. So John is also there at the scene of the cross. So, so getting back to the main point of the text of what we're unpacking today, again, the, the picture of what's going on here is that Jesus, who is God incarnate, who is God with skin and bone and so on, he is on the cross paying for the sin of the world. So what's happening here is this is the moment that all of human history has been pointing toward. This is the moment that God promised to Eve would happen all the way back in Genesis 3 where God said to Eve, don't worry, one day there will be a son who will crush the head of the serpent and who will defeat sin and death. This is the moment that that is being fulfilled. The moment that God has been promising and preordained in all of eternity past. This is the single most important moment in all of human history. That's the scene. That's what's going on here. 
And in this most important moment, in the middle of all the pain and suffering, Jesus stops, and this is what he says. Verse 26 again, it says, When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said this to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. You know, what's happening here is Jesus' mother Mary, she had been widowed. We don't know when this happened, but, but the last we've heard of Joseph, Jesus' stepdad, and Mary's wife was when Jesus was about 12 years old. So sometime between then and now, Joseph has passed away and Mary is a widow. And as a widow in the first century with no source of income, it was the responsibility of the oldest child to provide and care for his mother. But now that oldest child who is responsible for caring for her, now he is dying. He is on the cross and Mary is going to be left alone. I mean, she is sitting there watching her son suffer an unjust and cruel and inhumane death. So surely she would never say it. But, but I've got to imagine somewhere in the back of Mary's mind, she is thinking, how am I going to survive? How am I going to get by? Where's my meals going to come from? Where am I going to sleep and live? In this moment on the cross, again, the pinnacle of human history, as Jesus is paying for the sin of all mankind, he stops and he goes through the agony that it would have been to pull himself up by the nails in his hand to fill his lungs with enough air to be able to speak. And he looks at John and he says, John, take care of my mom. Treat her like you would your own mother. And he looks to John, or he looks to his mom and he says, Mom, don't worry. John's going to take care of you. Again, on the cross, think of how crazy this is. On the cross, the most important moment in human history, Jesus stops and he pauses to make sure that the needs of one single widow do not go unmet. And then it says, from that day on, John took Mary into his own home. So a couple of things that, that this shows us, that the words of teach us, reminds us of. The first thing is that this reminds us that each of us has a responsibility to honor and care for our family. Right As the people of God, if we are followers of Jesus, we all have a responsibility to honor and care for our families. I think in part what Jesus is doing here is he is showing us what it looks like to keep his commands and to live as his people. Right? Remember back to when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and the Israelites. One of those commands was to honor your father and mother. And here, in part, I think Jesus is showing, hey, here is what it looks like to honor your mother. Now listen, don't, don't get me wrong. Because Jesus absolutely did not live and did not die just to set a moral example for you and I. Right? Because you and I, we could never live up to the moral example that he would set. That's why he had to die in our place. So Jesus' life is not about a moral example. But in part, what he is doing here is I think he is saying to us, hey, as my people who are now empowered by my spirit, here's what it looks like to live out my commands. Here's what it looks like to honor your family. So Jesus, he's, he's reminding us that we have a responsibility to honor and care for our families. Right? He's reminding us that, that our family is the most important human relationship that we have. That your family is more important than your career. Your family is more important than your hobbies. Your family is, is more important than anything on this earth other than your relationship with God. And he's showing us here, he's reminding us that we are called to honor and care for our families. But that's not all he's showing us here. Because here, here's the reality. 
I'm sure there's some of you here, some of you watching online, who, who the idea of family and talking about family is difficult. Because maybe because of whatever circumstances, either you don't have family or maybe you do have family, but it almost would be better if you didn't because maybe there's been um, terrible evil or things like abuse and sin like that within your family. So, so, so thinking about this idea of honoring and caring for, for family is incredibly difficult for you. But here is the second thing that we learn from the words of Jesus. It's that regardless of whatever your family situation is here in this life, we learn here that through the cross, we are brought into God's family. That the cross gives us an extended family within the kingdom of God. So, so, so yes, as the people of God, we, we're absolutely called to care for and to honor our earthly families here in this life. But what we learn here is that through Jesus, our family is expanded beyond those related by our blood to those who are also related to us by the blood of Jesus. That Jesus' death and resurrection brings us into a new family. We see that. Because of his death, John is now bound to Mary, and Mary is now bound to John. And in that, Jesus is showing us something that goes far beyond just John and just Mary. Again, he's showing that through his death, any of us who have received the forgiveness of sin through his death, we are bound together as one. We are now family. Right, that's exactly what Paul says in Romans 12, 5. He says that in Christ, we are members of one body and we belong to one another. Paul says those of us who are in Christ, we are literally bound together. That's what Scripture says. This is so important for us to remember in what is our highly individualistic American culture that we live in. Because here in our culture, everything is about individualism and, and just you. And so we focus here in the church even sometimes, we, we focus so much on, hey, you need a personal relationship with Jesus. And listen, don't get me wrong. You absolutely need a personal relationship with Jesus. Being able to have a personal relationship with the creator God of the universe. And that's one of the incredible blessings of our faith. But you've got to understand, Jesus didn't die and rise from death and conquer sin for you to only have a personal relationship with him. He died and rose from death and conquered sin to save individuals who would then be brought into the family of God. When we're saved, we're not left on our own. We are brought into this new family. Listen, this is why sometimes, and, and maybe it's just the pastor in me, but it's kind of a pet peeve, and I think it's so silly when, when we hear people say things like, oh, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I don't need to be part of a local church. And listen, can you be a Christian and not be part of a local church? Absolutely. Coming to church doesn't save you. Right? Being a Christian is about receiving the forgiveness of your sin by grace through faith in Jesus. That's how you become a Christian, not by coming to church or attending a service or anything like that. However, saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to be part of a local church is like saying, I'm choosing to be estranged from my family. That's what it's like, because when God saves us, he doesn't leave us on our own. He brings us into this larger family. Jesus died in part to make us family, and we are bound together in Christ. And I remember so vividly when this truth became real to me. Because just a couple years ago, uh, my younger brother died suddenly and unexpectedly. He had uh, apparently been born with a brain aneurysm that no one knew anything about and had not caused any issues for 20-something years. And one day, it ruptured, and in a moment, he was gone. I had the most difficult, painful thing I've had to walk through in my life. 
But it was in that time of grief, it was the people who we were in community with at church who came around me and held me up when I wasn't able to stand on my own. And I still remember so clearly that the Sunday after my brother died, I obviously wasn't emotionally in a place where I was ready to lead or to preach that Sunday, but I knew I wanted to go to church. I knew I wanted to just go and sit with the congregation because my soul needed that. And that Sunday, I'll never forget, we, we sang a song that Kelly and the team are going to lead us in in just a few minutes. And one of the lines in that song says this. Many of you know it. It said, when darkness seems to hide his face, I'll rest on his unchanging grace. Right? When darkness seems to hide the face of God, I'll rest on his unchanging grace. And in that moment, that line just struck me to my core. Because in my pain, the grief was basically hiding the face of God from me. It felt like God was distant. It felt like God was no longer with me. Now, I I now know that, that God was always there, right? That he never leaves his people. That he never abandons us. But in that moment of pain, the grief was hiding the face of God, and I couldn't see him. But in that moment, it was, it was my church family who I could see, who I could touch, who I could feel, who I could reach out to, who I could lean on their shoulders and cry to. It was those people who, who showed me the very real and present grace of God. God so richly poured out his grace and mercy onto me through the, through the church family that he had brought us into. That's what the church is called to be for one another. It's a family. Now, as we wrap up this morning, can we just have a little bit of real talk for a second? Because family is difficult, isn't it? Right? Every family is dysfunctional. Every family is challenging. Every family is difficult. Uh, I like to say that every family has that one crazy uncle who shows up drunk to Thanksgiving, says a bunch of inappropriate things, and makes everybody feel incredibly awkward, right? And by the way, if, if you're thinking and you don't know who that crazy uncle is in your family, that means it's probably you, all right? So you need a wake-up call. But, but every family has challenges. Every family has issues. Family is tough. Because again, every family has conflict. Every family has tensions. Every family at times has hurt feelings. And it's no different with God's family. We're all flawed, sinful human beings. So when God brings us together into a new family, it's not always going to be rainbows and sunshine. All right, you've got to realize that. Think about it. In your earthly blood family, when you have conflict in that family, when you have an argument and a disagreement and somebody offends you, do you march right down to the courthouse and file legal paperwork to separate from them and find a new family? Of course you don't. How ridiculous would that be? That's not what families do. And so if we don't understand that we are also, we are family in Christ, then at the first sign of conflict, at the first sign of hurt feelings, at the first sign of disagreement, we will be tempted to say, all right, I'm done. I'm out. I'm checking out. I'm leaving. I'm finding another church. But again, you don't do that with family. Listen, my my actual family, we disagree about plenty We have arguments all the time. As I'm sure many of you do, we've got a family text group chat. And pretty much like every three days or something, somebody will send something in there that is stupid and ridiculous and wrong and I disagree with. But when that happens, I say, I'm done with you guys. I'm finding a new family to be part of. No. Again, that would be ridiculous. Family is bound to one another despite our disagreements, despite the conflicts that we may have from time to time. 
And in the exact same way, Jesus died to bind us together eternally as family. And so is that always going to be easy? Is that always going to be neat? Is that always going to be clean? No, of course not. Because being part of a family is never easy and neat and clean. It's messy and it's difficult and it takes hard work and it takes repentance and it takes forgiveness, but it's beautiful and that's what God's design for us is. So if you are in Christ, you are joined together with everyone else around this globe who is also in Christ. And as family brought together through Christ, we are called to honor and to care for one another. Let me pray for us.